All right, peeps, we are here with another dating relationship q and A. It's been a bit of a while since the last one. We had a well, we had the baby, right? We had the baby, and just you know, a lot of the periscopes being focused on the COVID cabal. But we got to get back into it, right? We got to get back into the dating relationship Q and A. So we got a bunch of good questions tonight. We're gonna try to go relatively fast through this. I got a hard deadline at six thirty for dinner, but uh, we'll start to bust them out. So first things, of course, the wine. Now we've now moved. You guys know we were in for really last time, so we're in northern Italy. And we have now moved on to Verona Valpolicello. Verona and Valpolicello. I'm glad, man. I'm glad. I'm glad with the uh, yeah, the, the wine section might not be as quite as bearable for, for you if you can't see it or you can't taste it. But as usual, so we got a couple, we got three tastings here. So we're starting off with some of the basic reds. And then we're going to do another vertical. And I'm, I'm using the same producer, you notice, because I, I like to get this consistency from a single producer. So we're doing Rosso Verona, which is going to be basically a, a basic Valpolicella, basically, I think, uh, unless they use some different varietals, which will be annoying. But um, this is really right next door. And Valpolicella Repasso, we'll talk about that in a second, and Bartolino. Next time, we're going to be doing Valpolicella, Valpolicella Repasso, and an Amarone. And then we're going to be doing <clears throat> Suave, which is the white from the area. So this is a kind of cool location. This is on Lake Garda. So to give you an idea in the grand, you know, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, right? This is uh, the Romeo and Juliet city. And what's kind of exciting for me is I've had plenty of Valpolicellas and I've had plenty of Suaves. I actually had a Suave last night. But Bardolino, never had, never had. In Bartolino's uh, denominations, where people talk about it, like you, you go to a tasting and someone's like, oh, maybe this is a Bartolino. And you're like, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is a Bartolino? So now I know what Bartolino is. So we're going to try it. It should be pretty much the same thing, guys. These grapes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save time focusing on the Rapasso difference. I only got the Rapasso because it was the only one that, that they didn't have a regular Valpolicella. These are all basic red wines, light-bodied, mostly a grape called Corvina. Corvina is the grape that you really want to have here. It's the superior grape. But they also have two other grapes, uh, Molinara and like Rondolara or whatever. They're, they're kind of lesser grapes. They could be blended in about 30%. So let's try this out. Let's see what we got here. I just want to make sure here. I'm just checking. Really hope that this this thing doesn't have like Merlot or something in it because there's no rules for the IGT Verona. That'll piss me off. I'll be able to taste it, by the way. I'll be able to taste that in like two seconds if they put some other shit in there. All right, look at this. So there's almost a little bit of a haze to it. I always like that. I always like a little bit of that stuff. All right, let's try it. Rosso IGT. First, let me give a smell to each of these because I just want to make sure. Hmm. They actually all smell a little bit different. This is going to be fun. All right. Very medicinal. Ooh, very medicinal. There's Merlot in this, guys. I know there's Merlot in this fucking people. They fucking put Merlot in it. I know they did it. What's the alcohol content? 14%. Those fuckers, they put Merlot in it. They fucking did it. Because look at the Bartolino. 12 and a half. Oh, sorry. I'm not showing you the bottle. 12 and a half percent. I knew it, man. I knew it. It's a cheap international consumption. Well, it's fine, but it's, there's, you know, I, Merlot has a very distinct profile. It's very like, there's, there's like a distinct kind of medicinal cherry to it. I swear to God, it's in there. All right, let's try the Valpolicella Repasso. This is going to be also a little hot. Much better than the Verona IGT. 
Although I, I do think that there's a little bit of Merlot in that. Guys, they can add up to 20% of Merlot even in the denominations. And I think they did it because they're looking to give it more weight. Traditionally, these wines were very light, right? Like 10 and a half, 11 and a half percent. And for international consumption, they tend to bump up the amount of alcohol in it. And part of that's because they've been using grapes from the plains because this area got their reputation really fucked up because very high yields were allowed. Remember, guys, we don't want high yields because high yields make bad wine. But so when they allowed high yields, <clears throat> what happened is that you start to get paid based on quantity, not quality. And if you're getting paid on quantity, not quality, then all the areas on the flat plain where it gets really hot and the wine doesn't get to be very, the grapes don't get the right kind of maturation. Those are the only people who made money. Because if you were on the slopes, you weren't getting a lot of money. So really great way to destroy a brand. And they've been trying to recover ever since. I'll talk more about that when we get into the Amarone because it's more relevant. This is just kind of a basic overview I wanted to do in addition. Because I, I wanted to involve the Bartolino. I wanted to do the Bartolino. I need to find a reason to justify the Bartolino. So I got these other ones. Speaking of the Bartolino, let's try it. This is a 12 and a half percenter. So much lighter. That is nice. That's nice. I got to get you guys on this. All right. I, I, I got I got to I got to persuade you guys. The high alcohol wines not that great. They can be really they they can be delicious. But there is such a better experience to have a wine that's 12.5%, 13% tops, really. When you get to 14% and up, and people don't even think of 14% as very high alcohol content. Um, 15 really is considered high, 14 half, 15. But guys, these lower alcohol content wines, especially the reds, right? You get reds around 12, 12 and a half, 13. You can, you can almost never find them in the States. They're almost like never produced in the new world. But you can get them in Europe. And that's just phenomenal. Perfect with food. Perfect with food. So out of the three, I mean, I have to say the Valpolicella Repasso. Is really well made. It's got... It's got a like perfect little bit amount of of, uh, of woodiness into it, so you can taste the oak, and um, obviously you got really rich cherries. It's like cherry juice, like ripe cherry juice, versus the Verona, which is like medicine, and then the Bartolino is really like strawberries. It's really bright. It's it's literally like strawberries, like like ripe strawberries. You know, and those strawberries like. The, the smell is just popping at you. Not those kind of big ones you get that are genetically engineered. The ones that are like tiny and ripe. That's the Bartolino. That's how it smells. That's how it tastes. Strawberry juice. That's what I'd say. It's strawberry juice. All right, guys. Let's get into the, uh, the dating relationship portion of this show. All right. Okay. First question. Hey, Pat, quick question re regarding a recent email you sent out. You can answer here or on your next dating periscope if you like. You helped a guy who was being strung along by an emotionally unavailable girl. He thought he was in the orbiter position, but he was more like the dude equivalent of a slump buster. Would you say she's the closest female approximately of a player, considering she has main dudes, side dudes, and even a guy on the wing? So it's a good way, it's an interesting way to phrase the question. Um, and I guess you could say, yeah, that is, that maybe that is the equivalent of female player. But I want to point out that even within the question, there's a little bit of an incons inconsistency here. She, you know, he was the dude equivalent of a slump buster. So is he busting her slump, a.k.a. is he the guy that she starts to fuck um, because she's just got out of a relationship and she's just looking for sex? Or is she a player? Those are two different things, right? 
So I would say it's true that the uh, I would say it's true that the um, you know that these that these girls that there are female players out there and they've got. Uh, you know, they, they got guy friends, they got all sorts of people, you know, in the wings and they'll hook up with some and then not others. And, and they're very much usually a free spirit. The female players, usually a free spirit. Um, although there are, there are more darker introverted versions who will be very ruthless about hookup schedules. They're, I mean, severely damaged women, by the way, severely damaged women, but the focus more on. I think what I would focus more on is to point out the fact that yes, he was a guy who had entered into the picture. She wanted the hookup and she was attracted, but she wasn't necessarily interested in something more. And I want to point that out because this is something that guys don't get. They don't understand it. They don't think that girls do this stuff, but women very often they are attracted to you and you're not relationship material for them either because they're not in the stage of life for it or because they just simply don't see you as being relationship material. They find you hot. There's an attraction there. <clears throat> and if the situation's right, they'll want to fuck. This is a tier three dynamic. Okay. Tier three dynamic is girl in your circle, girl in your situation who wants to hook up with you because she trusts you and is attracted to you, but there's no deep attraction, right? So be aware that women do this stuff. Be aware that women do these things. And I have to tell you, I fucked up some things when I was single. I fucked up a couple, a couple of interactions because I had kind of bought the PUA marketing that like if a girl's interested in you, then she wants you, which is completely not true. It's completely not true, guys. Do not, do not fall for that bullshit. Just because a girl wants to fuck you means absolutely nothing about her deeper emotions towards you. That's all just bullshit. It's all bullshit marketing. All right, next question. Hi, Pat. Another dating question for you. So I guess this kind of builds from my last question, but basically this girl and I have been friends for a while. She's had a long-term boyfriend up until two weeks ago. Let me make sure I'm processing this. Girl and I have been friends for a while. She's had a long-term boyfriend up until two weeks ago. They break up. We start hanging out a lot more. We finally hook up after some drinks and Netflix at her place, and we seem really good after, cuddling and joking around. The next day, she calls and tells me she feels like, she, like he was right when he was jealous of me when they were in a relationship. She feels like she might have cheated emotionally, but nothing happened while they were dating. We've talked about pacing this relationship because she is in a weird spot emotionally, but last night it just seemed like a lot happened very fast. I told her... We might have got ahead of ourselves and we should pull back a bit. She also asked if I felt like a rebound and I said no. Was this the right move? How do I proceed from here? I think I should just continue being fun and easy to be with and put no pressure for a relationship since she needs time to work through these feelings. This is amazing. It's also funny because, you know, I, I, I promise you guys, I don't read these questions ahead of time. I just throw them on a list. People send me DMs. I like, like it and throw it on a, on a list. I just look at them here. I don't, I don't, because that's the thing. I, I, people ask me all these questions. I do these periscopes because I get questions all the time. I just don't have time to respond to them, um, especially because I can communicate faster by speaking rather than writing. So, unless I have a, a question that's really long and really relevant to a bigger point that I can write about in an email, I'm going to do the periscope, right? I'm going to do the periscope, but I don't look at them. So, it's kind of funny that we just talked about the rebound in the previous question. Now we got another rebound of sorts. But this is not quite the same thing because it's quite obvious here that she does have emotions for this guy, but she also has emotions for her ex. Okay? She's got emotions for her ex. Now, I'm not saying these are emotions that mean she's going to go back to her ex. I'm not saying that because that's not going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. It could happen, but I don't think it's going to happen. You'd be a fucking idiot to take her back, to be fair. You are playing it perfectly. I don't really need to add too much to this. Be fun and easy. Give her space to come to you. Like you like you said, you said, no, she's on a rebound. But you know what? Take some space. Figure it out. It's exactly what you want. Women are cats. Okay? Women are like cats. 
and you don't get a cat to come with you. Guys, I got to tell you this. So in our current living situation, all right, got three bedrooms in the house. Parents have one bedroom. My wife and the baby are in another one. And I'm in the middle cat. Okay. It's me and the cat in the middle bedroom. And of course, you know, before any idiots here don't understand why that would be the case. Uh, you shouldn't sleep in a bed if you're a guy with a baby, because especially if you drink wine every night, because you could roll over onto the fucking baby and it's not, not smart. And also, I mean, it's just not, yeah, it doesn't make any the baby's going to wake up in the middle of the night. Why, why am I going to wake up? You know, I, I wake up if I have to wake up, but what's, but so the point is that I'm in the middle bedroom and the cat sleeps with me. Okay. But, but the cat, when I'm ready to go to bed, sometimes I'll try to get this cat. My cat's like quasi feral. I try to go get the cat and the cat's like pissed off. He'll like run around the house, chase after him. He's like going, you know, try to attack me if I try to grab him. But if I leave him, then sh- sure as day, cat comes in the bedroom, jumps in the bed. Women are like cats, guys. They're like cats. So doing the right thing, she'll, she'll come around. Most likely she'll come around. You're going to fuck her again. There's no doubt about that. You can't force the cat, guys. You can't force the fucking cat. All right. Uh, Hi, Pat. Do you have any articles on why women might not want kids and how to change their minds? Okay, no, I don't have any articles on that. Um, I'm not going to write articles on that either because you should not be persuading women to have kids. Don't do that, guys. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't do it. It's feminist alert. Uh, don't do that shit. Because I'm not saying that they sometimes don't change their mind. They do. They almost always have regrets. Not always, but almost always they have regrets um, when they don't have kids. There's a story with my wife. We had a um, friend in common. The reality here, guys, by the way, uh, she was more like friends with me. Obviously, she was interested in me. Okay, just to, to put that point out there, that it was one of those kind of complicated friendships, which is why male and female dynamics are a little bit uh, complicated on the platonic level. But we were all kind of friends, and you know, come to me for advice about things. Come to me for advice about things. And but my wife and her at one point they did they did hang out. And she was saying basically how she like didn't you know care. She felt fine about her dating situation, whatever. She's like 39 at the time. And my wife went in a room and there was like kind of like a serial killer looking montage of wedding dresses and wedding stuff. It's very sad, actually. It's really quite sad. So most of them do want kids. Most of them do want to get married. Someone took a picture of me. Took a picture of me. Am I looking good right now? Um so it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's, it, it happens. Okay. It happens. It happens. So most of them do want kids, but they don't know it, but you shouldn't persuade them. Otherwise don't waste your time on this stuff. Don't try to change their mind. Don't try to change anybody's mind. Okay. If I can tell you, well, just a little to, to close that loop, uh, no, she didn't marry. As far as I know, I haven't talked to her. Actually, I don't even think we've hung out since that night. But uh, she had been in a relationship with this guy who's a good guy, doing well for himself. Um, short. He was short. And at you know 37, she was being very picky because he was shorter than her. And that was a mistake because then she came back pining for him. And the guy had the good sense to say, fuck off, basically. So props to him. I never met him, but props to him and feel bad for her in a certain sense. But people make stupid choices and they got to live with them. You know, it's the reality of the situation, which is why you don't want to change their minds. Don't try to change. Screen women for what they want with kids. Screen them for this. Don't force anybody into a choice because that's a sign of weakness is a sign of uh, scarcity. No abundance, right? No abundance. You got to try to convince a woman to go along with your plan. No, I mean, when you're in that early selection phase, there is no way in hell you should be trying to persuade a woman to do these things. 
This is ridiculous. So I don't have any articles on it. The lesson is do not try to change their mind. Just end things and say, well, you don't want kids and I do. So good luck. If enough guys did that and they kept losing out on good guys, then they might rethink their choices. They might be like, maybe I'm making stupid decisions. But look, some women don't want kids and that's okay. I'm not saying that they can't do it. People can make their own choices. I respect your choice. I respect you to make a choice, even if it's a very stupid choice for yourself. I respect it. And again, not everybody should have kids, but um, I do think that 9 out of 10 are better when they have them. They feel better when they have them. So unless you're that 1 out of 10, and most are not the exceptions to the rule. All right. Hi, Pat. Hope all is well with you. I wanted to ask you if you can discuss more about generational trauma and how to heal from it. I remember this was discussed in some variation in your previous Periscopes, but I was hoping if you would drill more onto it when you have a chance. Thank you for your great work. So, um, a lot of what we're doing right now is healing generational trauma. It's hi highly related to our you know, dating relationship situation because... Look, we are at the point right now where we are, I mentioned this in the COVID cabal, but we are breaking out of, of sort of confined generational families. We're in a process of awakening and it's more important than ever to sort of heal this trauma. And when we talk about healing trauma, we talk about breaking, first, first of it is breaking contracts with our family that we don't need to have, Right. So a lot of generational trauma, it's called generational trauma because it repeats over and over and over again. So if you have a generational situation where you have hysterical women who are hysterical generation after generation, if you were a woman, then you would be like, you know what? I'm not going to be like my mother. I'm going to stop being like my mother. I'm going to deal with the root causes and the root pain that my mother and my grandmother faced in their relationships with men. And also as a result, I'm not going to choose my father because my father paired up with my mother. Right? So you break the pattern. You've ever heard people say that, you know, sons marry their mothers and daughters marry their fathers. Well, that's generational trauma right there. Not necessarily trauma. I should, I should caveat that because sometimes it's healthy, but most of the time, that's a trauma pattern. It's a repeated pattern over and over and over again. So you deal with that by reflecting on your baggage, getting to the root of issues, right? That's dealing with trauma. Dealing with your own personal baggage is dealing with generational trauma because if you're doing a good job with your baggage, then you will come to the conclusion that you inherited a lot of it, which is why when I talk to guys and I deal with the deep work with them. I go through their relationships with women, but I also go through their family because the two are completely connected with each other, completely connected. So we're breaking these contracts and it may mean breaking out of your family, but I think we're going to see a wholesale kind of um, thing that's going to be happening across the board. People are going to be with parts of their family very close, other parts separated from them. And we are sort of choosing on a deep level how we're going to connect going forward. And people like here, you know, who we all feel very similarly, will be creating our sort of new collective groups and leaving those who are refused to heal, basically. We don't have to deal with their stuff because one of the aspects of generational trauma is that the generations try to force you to deal with their problems. You know, I have to say this. You have a lot of med Twitter, right? Mediterranean Twitter. Love med Twitter, by the way. I love med Twitter. I am a flanner, okay? You can, Im you can imagine me chilling by the water. Hey, my fucking Twitter avi, right? It's me fucking south of France, okay? Sipping champagne. That is me. I'm moving to Europe for a reason, okay? I'm moving to Europe for a reason because that's me. I want to I wanna talk bullshit, talk about ideas, and drink good wine by nature. That's what I like. However, however, uh, med Twitter's kind of whole like obsession with the family is in my Anglo Northern European perspective, 
uh, not entire, not completely unhealthy. There's a lot of positives, but there are negatives, guys. There are negatives. There are negatives to this shit. Okay, I do not agree. I do not agree with the family deciding who you should marry. I do not agree with subjecting the individual to the collective, even if it's in your family. A healthy family respects individuality of the of the people there. Okay, they're there for each other. They love each other. They don't try to control each other. I I am not a big fan. I'm in I'm in Jersey by the way, and I have Italian relatives. I know what the Intali- Italian. It's funny, right? It's fun to watch, but the Italian incestuous sort of overbearingness. Not a fan of that stuff, guys. Not a family of the family guilt. Exactly. Not a fan of it. And God bless my half Italian mother, because if there's one thing, and she actually got this from her mother, but she had to break out of it because she was in an abusive relationship. And the one thing she always passed down was do not fucking feel guilty about anything. Do not let people make you feel guilty. Guilt is a form of control. And God bless that message because um, I could have really gotten manipulated bad by that. I already had some guilt. I had to get rid of like a lot of guys, but it could have been a lot worse if I didn't have that message getting passed down from my mother's family, by the way. My father's family has a lot of guilt. So it's kind of interesting. And they're not, they're Anglo. So I guess, you know, there's different obligations, I guess you could say, right? Different obligations. So we're breaking out of all of it. All right, next one. Let's go down here. All right. Oh, this is a fun one. Catholics are the worst for this. But you know, but you know, well, actually, to be fair, uh, my grandmother was technically my Italian grandmother out of convenience because she was one of seven. Okay. Italian family, full Italian family. Both parents uh, came from Southern Italy. And neither spoke English for a long period of time. And they never spoke in the house. And, but because of where they lived, my grandmother, in contrast to the rest of her siblings, was actually baptized in the Protestant church. And so she was never a Catholic. Now, my mother was raised Catholic, but my mother's really more of a um, Pentecostal. Like, she's, she's never gone to confession. Okay, so... She's a very mystical Catholic who also thinks the Pope's a Satanist. So complicated, right? Complicated stuff. So maybe that was part of it. Um, so, hey, Pat, I was wondering if cheating as a married man is ever acceptable. If you're married and happy and stable while you're away, catch a fling and it's a good time. You have some fun. The husband returns home and still loves his wife and nothing changes. Is this ever realistic? And is there typically a consequence for this? Well. Everyone wants my Ukrainian prostitute that Salman promised me. People are like, Pat can't take it. Pat can't take it. So I want it. Everyone wants it. But Salman's probably going to insist. I'm not going to take it, Salman. I'm not going to take the, the Ukrainian prostitute. But I appreciate the gesture. I appreciate the gesture. Um, but yeah, I guess relevant to this, is it okay for a married man to cheat? Well, I mean, I guess it'd be pretty stupid if I admitted that, right? But I'm, I'm fucking joking. I'm fucking joking. I don't, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with it. I do think that guys do it. And there are women who believe that it's really not a big deal. Because they look at themselves, and I think this is actually a, an, an appropriate way to look at themselves, as they care about the status and being the queen, right? And so why would the queen care about the mistress? Why would the queen especially care about the courtesan, right? Why would she care about these women? Because she has the position, her children are legitimate. And I have to be honest, guys, there's an element in the male minds. I think we guys, any guys watching this can admit this. There's an element in the male mind that can really distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate. There's an element. There's an element. But, but, I think all of this stuff is really downstream of Madonna whore and um, elements of the man not fully integrated into his relationship with a woman. Okay? Men who want to cheat if you want to cheat as a man 
or let me put, let me rephrase this. If you want to sleep with another woman as a married man, then there are two things that you should do. Okay, the first is you need to figure out what the fuck, why. Okay, obviously you're a man. Maybe you want to just fuck other women. Okay, I, I, I get that. I get that. Is there something in your relationship that's not being fulfilled though? What is it? And it may be sexual. It may be emotional. Can that be communicated or expressed in, in the relationship? Okay, first off, how big of a priority is it? But can that be expressed and communicated in the relationship? Most of the time, guys cheat because they can't express their feelings. And I say most, I really mean like nine out of ten times, guys cheat because they are not getting what they want emotionally or sexually in the relationship. And I think the two are mostly connected. I think usually cheating is mostly emotional, even for men. It's mostly emotional. They want to have, they want to sleep with their wife, but the wife doesn't want it or the wife's like fat and got completely out of shape and is, you know, unattractive, but that's a separate conversation. Then it's like, then talk to her about how you feel about how she's been treating your body. Right. But you can communicate a lot more of these things than people acknowledge. Um, people don't want to communicate it because out of fear. So th that's why you have these kind of questions and it's no offense to the person who asked the question. I appreciate the question, but this is very common with guys. It's like, well, why can't I just go cheat because why can't I just go cheat? Because, you know, that would be like, if she doesn't find out, it's no big deal. Right. Well, how would you feel if she did that to you? How would you feel if she did that to you? It weighs on the conscience. Unless you're a sociopath, unless you're, maybe it's more psychopath, the more appropriate term, unless you're a psycho psychopath, it weighs on the consciousness. You can't keep these kind of lies. So you either need to renegotiate the relationship and talk about it. And look, I'm not big on, I'm not like a polyamory endorser, but I think that people can negotiate their own contracts with each other. And so some couples have things like, if I don't know, then I don't care. In which case, fine. Fine. You know, maybe they have enough trust and it's all right. There's exceptions, but I'm trying to talk to the norm is that usually when a guy, usually when a guy goes and fucks a random woman when he's away, it's because he's not satisfied in his relationship. And I appreciate the comment here about how it's the newness and stuff, the main cause. I don't really, as a, I mean, I don't really believe that that's true. I don't believe it's true. I, from my experience working with men, that is really overstated. What men are missing in relationships, for the most part, depends on the guy. I agree with that. It depends on the guy. But what men are, are missing in the most part in relationships that make them want to cheat is the feeling that their woman really wants them and the feeling of connectedness to their woman. They want that. They want the sexual charge. They want the desire from the person that they're with. And to be away and have another woman to hook up with another woman, that's a taste of that. It's a taste of the excitement again. It's usually dead relationships. The subset where that's not the case are probably, they're having, if they're having sex all the time and yet the guy still wants to fuck new women, it should be usually a pretty easy relationship to renegotiate to make it open because then you're dealing with a very, very high sex drive couple, right? Very, very, very high sex drive couple. And that's much more understandable. I mean, you, you would just, you, you're so sexually oriented at that, in that case in the relationship that you could probably negotiate a lot of kinky open things with each other. But for most men, that's not the case. They're just afraid to talk about it. They're, they'd rather cheat. That's my perspective. All right. I think I actually maybe only have time. Oh, well, let me see. All right. We have one big question here I got to get to. We'll see if we can get through them all. We'll see. We're going to try. We're going to try. Hi, Pat. How are you, man? Question for the Dane Periscope. I met a girl in the beginning of last month who was the best friend of my cousin. Okay. I live in the northeast of Brazil and live in Sao Paulo in the southeast. They 
Wait, and they live in Sao Paulo in the southeast. Okay. So northeast versus southeast. They both came, the girl and my cousin, to my state to get to know the beaches we have here in the countryside and invited me to spend time with them. We spent three days together. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to make sure I read everything. We spent three days together and it was really good and I really got into this girl. I did not try to kiss her because it was just me, my cousin, and her. And it would be kind of bad to hook up with her because it was just three of us, dot, dot, dot. But I told the girl that when, when I go to her city, I would invite her to have dinner and it would be just the two of us. She said that would be awesome. I also noticed that she was complimenting my looks and saying I was smart man during our trip. We had a little chemistry. Time goes by and both her and my cousin invited me to spend the new year with them in another beach in here in Brazil. I accepted but find the hotel price too expensive and they told me that it wouldn't be a problem if I stay with them in their room, so I accepted. So we started talking in WhatsApp during these times, but one day she posted a picture on Instagram tagging a guy. So there's another guy in the picture. But she still keeps saying to me once in a while that she can't wait to see me and looks forward to our new year together. Do you think she put me in the friend zone or is just playing games? I know that her value diminished because of this, but I still want to at least hook up with her. What are the steps you recommend me to do? Still invest or would it be a waste of time? I kind of stopped WhatsApping her because this pissed me off. Thanks a lot, man. Okay, update. Some new stuff just happened that got me really mad. You were supposed to come here in the same flight and right at the moment that I slept on the plane, which was yesterday, she told me that she had put off her flight to December 28th, which is today, and posted pictures with the man that she's saying is her boyfriend right now. This made me really mad and all I want to do is ignore her, Pat. I don't know how she would react here in front of me, but I will reduce my attention to zero. Okay, well, the initial part we were kind of leading to this in the sense that... <clears throat> I want to make a couple of points here. Okay, first point is that, um, first point, I get the whole, you know, the cousins here. You don't want to intervene. I don't know the relationship with your female cousin, but uh, as somebody who hooked up with half of my female cousin's friends, I would say that you need to get okay with that because she's bringing her friends towards you directly okay now, i mean she may not tell you directly what she's doing but she's bringing her friend into your world and so long as you're not like a total piece of shit about this you should be able to isolate and, and escalate you should be able to do it you could tell your cousin to you know you have a good relationship with her you could tell her like look get out of here for a second i, I gotta kiss your friend right you can say that stuff i don't know your dynamic maybe you can't but I think I think you probably can, especially because this is Brazil, right? It's a little familiarity with South American culture. So that's the first thing. You should have made a move, because as Romeo is saying down here, which by the way, Romeo, you know we're doing Verona right now, so I didn't, I didn't even put that together. As Romeo is saying down here, the distance is an issue, and you're going to experience, unless you cross a physical threshold, you're going to... Find yourself in a, uh, how do I put this? You're going to find yourself in a declining situation, a diminishing situation. And so this other guy's in the picture. He's closer to her. He's giving her more attention. So she, you, you were not necessarily friend zoned from the beginning, but that, but you left a big opening for it to happen. And it did happen as we now know from the update, it did happen. So I would simply, um, Honestly, I would just not go. I know, I'm sorry. This is like probably late in the game. I would just not go. I would not go to that with them for New Year's. I would bail. It's a waste of your time to go. It's a complete waste of your time to go to this thing. Okay? Don't do it. Because she is going to be there. It sounds like she's going to be there. Um, I don't know if she's going to bring her boyfriend or not. But there's just no point in going. It's a complete waste of your time. So just say your plans change and you're going to go elsewhere. And honestly, that's going to that's gonna hurt her a little bit in a good way. Because she's going to be like, oh, no, why are you leaving? Why are you not going to come? And you're just like, oh, you know, stuff with some friends. Decide to go do that instead. She's not getting any of her attention, which makes your value go up. So 
I gotta tell you guys, I gotta tell you, man, right? And everybody got everybody who's listening here. Whenever you have a girl do this bullshit to you, like a lot of guys get waylaid, okay? I will tell you at some point a story of this stuff in Argentina that happened to me. Um, Latin girls are very classic with this stuff. You just got to get the fuck out. Honestly, you just got to get the fuck out. And most guys don't even have a chance. They don't have the knowledge, the foreknowledge like you do. They walk into that situation and then they're trapped and it fucking sucks. Okay? So you had the foreknowledge. So literally, like, either go spend time with other friends down there if you have them. Find out different plans and cancel your flight. I'm serious. It is a complete waste of your time to spend time with this girl. And the only way you keep it open is by bailing on her abruptly like that. That'll fuck with her head a lot. So, all right. I'm going to try to get these last ones. we got 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes here. Okay. Hi, Pat. Oh, I, I actually know this one. Hi, Pat. I like your content. I have a question for you. I love my husband dearly. I am also totally attracted to him. However, after getting a baby, my body confidence took a dip and I can't seem to keep up with his libido. Strangely, though, I'm lusting over a former lover, even though he's married. I masturbate to the thought of the sex we had in the past. Surely this cannot be normal. Would you advise me to visit a therapist? What exactly is my problem? Thanks a bunch and happy holidays. Stay healthy. Regards. Okay. First off, guys, who are eavesdropping on this female question, uh, I hope that you understand here the importance of not being dicks to, you know, dicks to women in the sense of being nasty about how women are. Okay being nasty about how women are. I really hope that you that you do this because look. People have emotions and they don't necessarily like the sort of impulses that they have. And they don't necessarily like them, but they get them. And so to think of like women as being bad because they do certain things, it's just not fair. It's not fair, okay? So um I would say kind of per what Romeo was saying is that, you know, you mentioned it's very common. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't, don't make a big deal out of it. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily body image issue. I don't know. I mean, we could try to, we could try to diagnose this on a deeper level, but you shouldn't really view this as like, there's something terribly wrong with you. Okay. Because all women, all men as well have these sort of dark parts of their nature and they crop up and they crop up in the fantasies. Okay. So I don't know the nature of your relationship with your husband, but I would say, I would say that this is an opportunity for you to take your sexual relationship to a different level. Okay. I'm not saying that you tell him that this is what you're fantasizing about. Um, I don't think that it's productive. Okay. But, Obviously, there's an element of your sex life that doesn't integrate enough of the dark energy from this ex. And so I think if you can start to introduce some things to entice a little bit of that to be integrated into the relationship, you would start to feel you start to feel some more. Perhaps you start to feel some more. Um, it sounds as if right now that you are attracted to him physically and you love him you love him as a person and you want to satisfy him but it also sounds to me like you're not really thinking enough of expressing your own sexual needs in the relationship your own sexual desires and so maybe it's time to talk a little bit more about that i can't guarantee that this is going to solve the full problem but i think a lot of us who have dated the opposite sex that has a bunch of dark energy. There's always a little bit of seduction from that. And it's okay that we, that we feel some of it, but we want to try to integrate and bring as much of it into our healthy relationship as we possibly can. So don't shame yourself and don't feel like, oh, I got to see a therapist. I'm so fucked up for having this. No, it is very normal. It's very normal. It's very normal. Every, everybody at some point in their life, they have these little impulses and, you're a good person. 
try to bring it into your relationship as best you can. And of course, remember that your fucking ex is your ex for a reason. So just remember to, to not keep him on a, you know, I know that it's just like a sexual fantasy thing, but really limit. I would almost try to remove him from it. Try to abstract it if you can. So the individual to himself doesn't get elevated. Okay. Um, let's see here. I agree. Okay, so this is this is um this is regarding my kind of post about players. This is an old email I've written about players. And you know what? I'm going to I'm going to say this guys. I'm going to say this for the next one. We have three more questions. We'll do this on the next day in relationship periscope. My computer's actually about to run out of battery, so I think it's a good time. Um I think we're going to have covid cabal tomorrow. I think we'll have covid cabal tomorrow because feeling some stuff coming, feeling some stuff coming soon. But we'll talk soon peeps. I'll see you later.